Alright dudes, how's it going and welcome to Over the Gun TV's How to Configure Hypercam. Now Hypercam can be quite daunting to a new user, but it's not that complicated. The main art of using Hypercam is contained within the codec configuration, and I'll be going through that with you as well. Now when you first fire up Hypercam, you'll be presented with this screen area tab. Select region will select a specific box on screen to record. Select window will select a specific window, which you'll, you'll see like a red outline around the box that you want to record. The start X, start Y, width and height boxes will be filled in automatically by select region and select window. You don't need to change them, you can manually change them, but you won't need to. 99% of the time select region and select window will do it just fine for you, you don't need to change them. Show rectangle around the recorded area will do as it says, it will show a red line around the area that you're capturing. Mets rectangle blink will make it blink, it's quite distracting, quite off-putting. You don't need it to blink, so I wouldn't recommend having that checked. And the other three options, leave Hypercam window open, will leave a box like this open even when you're recording, not really recommended. Iconize Hypercam window to the taskbar is what I normally use, it'll just put it onto the bottom taskbar. And hide Hypercam window will just totally make it invisible, there'll be nothing on the taskbar, no icons around, no box around when you start recording. As soon as you stop recording, the box will appear again. Now the captured layer slash transparent window box if for some reason you cannot record something, if something gives you trouble, feel free to check it and see if it helps out, but by default, don't have it checked. You won't need it checked. 99% of the time, it won't do anything for you, so don't have it checked. Moving on to the hotkeys tab, F2 will start and stop recording, F3 will pause recording, pressing F3 again will resume recording, and F4 will take a screenshot, but you'll need to pause to take a screenshot. So you press F2 to start recording, press F3 to pause, press F4 to take a screenshot, and then press F3 again to resume, carry on recording, press F2 to start recording. The pan options, now in case you're not sure what panning is, you may have seen some other tutorial videos or other videos where the video seems to follow where the mouse is going, that's panning. And you've got a few ways you can go about doing it in regards to what keys you use. If you press shift and control and hold them down and then move the mouse, it will follow it around. As soon as you release, it'll stop following. You could have the lock permanently box checked, and that means it'll always follow it around. Regardless of what keys you've got pressed, etc., it'll always follow it around. And you've got a pan lock key. Pressing Shift F3 will make it follow the mouse around. As soon as you press F Shift F3 again, it'll stop following the mouse. Whether or not you use panning is entirely down to your preference and what video you're creating. Moving on to the AVI file tab. Now, this is the tab that most people fall down on. It's um, not complicated to set up, but it does contain quite a lot of information and it will make or break your recording. The AVR file name box, that'll contain where you wish to record to. It'll also contain what you want to have your recordings called. And if you add this sequential number to the file name box ticked, it'll add a number each time you start and stop recording. So if I pressed F2 and then F2 again to stop recording, it'd be say clip 001. If I pressed F2 and F2 again, it'd be clip 002, clip 003, clip 004, so on and so forth. It just makes it so that you're not overwriting your own recordings. You can change where they go to and what name they are yourself, it's totally down to your preference. Make sure that record sound is checked if you want to record the sound of whatever you're doing, say if it's a game or an MP3 or a video, etc. Now the rate in frames per second, a lot of people get confused on this one as well. It's entirely down to your preference and what quality of video you want as to what frames per second you record at. Personally, I recommend using 30 frames per second with Hypercam. It's nice, it's safe, it looks good, it's solid. But you can use higher and you can use lower. I wouldn't recommend going much lower and I wouldn't recommend going over 60 frames per second. The, l the, um, the lower the number, the less frames and the jerky the footage is going to be. The higher the number, the more frames is going to be and the smoother the footage is going to be. To be fair, the only time I'd really recommend using above 30 frames per second is if you're recording something like a first person game. And if you're recording a first person game, ideally you should probably should be using another recorder such as Fraps, but that's for a different video. The playback tab um, box just needs to be left alone, don't mess around with that. As you, it, You'll see that it changes based on whatever the recording frames per second um, number is. So leave the um, playback thing alone, like I say for the recording frames per second, I recommend 30 for the majority of the videos that you record, but feel free to go higher if you wish. But bear in mind that the footage will be bigger and 
it will take longer to render. And for the, some games, you won't even notice much of a difference, to be fair. First person games, certainly. 3D games, quite possibly. Old school 2D games and such, not so much. So between 30 and 60 frames per second is recommended. Cursor slash full frame capture ratio, once again, leave that box alone, leave it as one. Keyframe every 100 frames, once again, leave that box alone. The frame compression quality will probably be 75% by default. Bump it up to 100% to retain as much quality as possible. Now the video compressor is one thing that causes a lot of confusion as well. Now there's two options that I'll recommend to you. One is DivX and the other is XVID. Now they're pretty much both the same thing, they just work ever so slightly different, but they are in essence the same thing. As you can tell, DivX and XVID, XVID is just DivX backwards. So they are effectively the same thing. Except XVID is 100% free, doesn't matter what version of XVID you download, it will be free. DivX is free for old versions, but new versions like this one won't be free. So it entirely depends on your budget and what you want to use. I'm going to show you how to set up both of them, but I use DivX probably about 9 out of every 10 recordings. If every blue moon you may come across an emulator or a specific video or just something does not like DivX, and if that's the case, use XVID instead. But it can entirely depend on what PC and what settings you're using, so either one of these two codecs should sort out your Hypercam. So I'm going to select DivX. If you've not got DivX or XVID in that drop down menu, chances are you've not installed the codecs correctly. Try uninstalling the codec and reinstalling it again. You will need to close and reopen Hypercam if you've not done so. So click the configure this compressor. The first thing you want to change is the certification profile. Change it from what is probably home theatre profile by default to unconstrained. And very quickly, the codec properties box here may look different for you depending on what version of DivX you're using. But the base properties, the things that I'm going to show you how to change, will be there somewhere. They are generic properties to change. So change the certification profile to unconstrained. Leave the encoding presets alone. Go down to rate control. Now rate control by default will probably be set on one pass with a bit rate of 780 as you can see there. Now you can change the bit rate up, but what I'd recommend just for the um just for easiness sake, change it to one pass quality based. And in the fixed quantizer box, you can put anything in there from one to whatever you want. As the um, description says, lower quantizers lead to better quality but large files, and obviously um, higher quantizers the quality is worse but the file size is smaller. Now for the sake of recording, I use anywhere between 1 and 4. I can't tell much difference between Quantizer 1 and Quantizer 2, so I generally just use 2. But you can, depending on the speed of your PC and what you're recording, you can feel free to play around and find which Quantizer works best for you. But like I said, I'd recommend anything between 1 and 4. If you then click the Codec tab, this is another quite cornerstone setting. The Codec Performance. Now, Depending on what version of DivX you've got, whether it's a free version or not, it'll let you set different options here. As you can tell, it goes from fastest up to insane quality. Now, I recommend using the fast option, but you will not be able to use the fastest option on a free version of um, this version of DivX Pro. Maybe an early version, maybe a later version, I'm not so much sure. But I know for a fact that my version of DivX Pro needs to be registered to get this fastest encoding mode. What the fastest encoding mode is doing is recording footage as fast as possible and sacrificing compression. So the files end up being larger and you need to have a higher quantizer to retain quality, but it'll lead to less desync, which is really critical if you don't have such an awesome PC. In a nutshell, the faster your PC, the further down here you can go without it deteriorating your sync on the video. But I'd recommend using the fastest option. The fastest option 